Hello everybody and welcome back for another video where today we look at air compressor pumps and how we can use the information from the air compressor pumps, how it works, a look inside them to basically create a system where we have a pump and motor so that we can use compressed air to run any sort of pneumatic tools. So let's get started. So here is an air compressor pump. It consists of basically a bottom, uh, the bottom section right here, the casting. Uh, which then has the jug or the cylinder heads, the actual head, and then we have uh, valving inside there connected to the pulley. So as we rotate this pulley right here, there's a crank inside that has two pistons. Those pistons are connected to the crank with connecting rods, and then they're attached to the actual pistons themselves. So as I rotate this, the piston travels up, compressing air, and then leaves through a valve that allows air to flow out through an exit over here. And we're gonna show close-ups of this. As I continue to rotate, the air is sucked in through the other piston or through the other cylinder, in through a valve here, which pulls or draws the air in. And as it keeps going, the piston's gonna travel up, shut one valve, and basically open the compressor valve and the exhaust leaves. That's the basics behind this type of air compressor pump. So now we're gonna take a little closer look at it uh, from the top and see how everything looks. Okay, so this is the air compressor pump. And let's get a quick look at it from the side. So you can see the side here. As I pointed out before, you have the casting of the main block, the cylinder itself or jug, the cylinder head, and then this is basically just a little spot to, that seals off for our valving so we could access it when we need to. And then the pulley in the front. So let's take a look at the valves inside. And we're going to kind of break this down step by step. Okay, so now that we saw from the side view, let's take a look at what's underneath this portion right here or this cover to access the valves. So this pump... actually probably could get rebuilt to work again, but I'm not really concerned about it. Bought myself a little bit better of a pump. So now when we open up that cover, we see two sides. We see these valves right here, these reed valves, and then we have another side over here. Uh, what happens is, I'm just gonna put these screws back in to kind of hold everything in place. What happens is, is as we rotate this pump, the pistons inside are traveling within the bores of the cylinder. As we continue to rotate in a clockwise direction here, air is gonna get pulled in. These valves, you might be able to show it here. If I push, you could see that I can allow air in. So it's gonna pull or draw air in as those valves, or uh, sorry, as the cylinders or pistons are moving down in the cylinders. On this side, these remain shut. So there's no, they barely move, or just a little bit. So we're gonna pull air in, 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 in. Eventually what's gonna happen is the pistons towards the bottom of their stroke are gonna start moving back up in the cylinders. That's gonna force these valves closed and then allow the air to come out here and then exhaust out through this side. And that's the basics of it. We can go in deeper and see the actual pistons traveling up and down. So when we pull the actual head off, let's look a little bit closer, here we go. You can see those valves there and I can actually, oh, let's get something from this side. And you can see, we can push and move those valves, those little reed valves. Uh, some people will actually rebuild these valves. So you can see that one. They're actually a little bit different spring rates on them. Uh, this will allow air to get drawn in and then as this one too. So I'm, I'm assuming, I just noticed this for the first time, that basically towards one end of the stroke, it's easier to pull open. And then here, as the stroke gets a little bit further or the piston's in a different spot, this one valve right here will also allow more air to come in. Okay, so those are those. Then these are the exhaust. Right there, and if we could push on those, you can 
can see they, they may move a little bit. I think this one, one of them was definitely easier. There you go. Those are the exhaust. Okay, so that's the head. That there. there. Now, as you can see as I rotate this clockwise, okay, like that, you can see that they travel. Let me see if I can get this somewhat situated so it doesn't move. Now, you can see here how those pistons move up and down inside. I mean, this is really no different than a car motor or engine. There we go. Then up and down. What allows the compressor to actually work or these pistons inside the cylinders to create a tight seal are these rings right here. So these rings basically will sit in grooves inside those pistons and we'll take a look at those too as we pull this off. If these rings that are sitting inside there, they apply some sort of spring tension against the cylinder walls are not sealing properly, then basically it'll allow air to seep through past the pistons and into the crankcase here and uh, won't do its job. So let's pull this off now. Okay, got that off finally. So now we can actually see the insides. Let's get this rotated a little bit more. So we'll turn this around. You have the connecting rod, piston, and the crank inside. And you can see the grooves where these rings would basically sit in. So these are gonna go in, into those grooves like so like that. And you can see they kind of float inside there. This bottom one is an oiling ring. So there should be oil in the bottom of there. And as it splashes around and lubricates everything, this will scrape the oil. And then you have two sealing rings, basically one here and here. Now what happened with this one is the oil was basically either run dry or really, it was like really stiff oil. Um, this got all gummed up and then basically seized up inside here, inside the actual uh, cylinders themselves. And it basically just caused it to stop running. Uh, it could probably get rebuilt. There's kits for these for new rings. So I could eventually rebuild this, uh, new gaskets and everything like that. But that essentially is the inside of an air compressor pump or piston style air compressor pump. Uh, so what I'm gonna do next is show you basically another, uh, another piston style pump, just a little bit different configuration, how it works with the air compressor and everything else. What we have here is a 60 gallon air compressor. Air compressors are usually denoted by the size of the actual tank. And then we look at things like the horsepower and the PSI rating of it. So 60 gallons of air can be held inside here. We have a six horsepower electric motor connected to a pump. This pump is similar to the other one, except that instead of the cylinders being uh, right next to each other, they're opposed up here into this basically V-shaped pattern. So we have a cylinder here, cylinder here with pistons inside them. These are air intakes. Basically, as this electric motor turns the pulley that's in back over here, it will cause the crank inside to rotate, moving the pistons up and down. The air comes in through here, and just like the other one, there's a series of reed valves that will allow air in on the intake stroke and then close on the compression stroke. Then the air is forced, you'll see this tube back here, out into, and let's get this a little bit closer over here. Okay. So this is gonna be that exhaust tube. And then that's gonna run into this copper tube right there. That copper tube then goes into the tank. And that air gets compressed and basically we can read the pressure inside the tank. So right now I've had it turned off and not running and it's holding at around a little over about 85 PSI. Notice here we got the little stanchion coming off, which connects to this. 
This, this box right here is for an automatic start off. What it does is it's able to sense the pressure through this tube that comes up and wraps around to a shut off switch. So basically as that pressure builds up, this one down on this side is gonna get moved up, 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 and eventually it contacts this very little pin that you can see there. When it contacts that, it stops, it uh, shuts off the power to the electric motor and basically bleeds any pressure that's left in those at the same time so that they're not continually under pressure and then it shuts off. When this, um, basically when we run the pressure out, it'll cause that little pin to basically pop down. Uh, it trips then for the circuit to go and that's it, it starts back up. Over here on the outlet side of the tank, so we leave out through here, I have a valve, so I can actually turn this on now. You hear the air going in. We go through a filter, basically a little bit of a water separator. You can actually see some droplets of water in there. <clears throat> I'll talk about that in a moment, to the actual gauge pressure. So now here I can adjust the pressure up or down of what I want my tools to run at. And then they're fed to a coupling and then out into the hose. And then that is essentially our whole system. Now we do have a couple of prob a couple of issues with air compressors. One issue is that as I pull air in, uh, I'm compressing air to roughly 145 to 150 psi in this tank if I let it run. When I'm compressing all that air, yeah, let's just set this back up. When I'm compressing all of that air, I'm um, taking in contaminants, water, and anything else that might be in the air. So as the air comes in, I'm collecting more and more water. Also, as air compresses, it heats up. So not only are we getting warm air or hot air, but then that hot air is able to collect more moisture. And that moisture can collect inside the tank. So basically as it compresses, it heats up. And as I let it sit and cool, whatever water vapor is in there is gonna condense and form into liquids and then these have to drain out. The water and contaminants can damage tools. So then we have that little system over here on the right to basically help filter out any contaminants from the system. Also because it's slightly bold design, it does allow for a little bit of expansion which cools air and can collect some water here. Uh, sometimes there's a little valve on the bottom here that I can push up and you can drain a little bit of water out. They do sell desiccant filters that'll basically pull even more water vapor out of the air but uh, for, and that's usually more for spraying, uh, like air guns and, and paint guns and stuff like that. But that's the basics of your compressor there. And that's it. And I'm trying to think what else there is. I don't think so, there's not much. That's your basic compressor. Uh, a couple of things are important when replacing motors. So I replaced that one motor I showed earlier with this one. This one is able to, it's got um, bigger bores and pistons in there so I can compress more air quicker. It also runs at a higher PSI. The issue that we need to do is make sure that this pump is operating at its peak RPM. So that pulley in the back is rotating at the correct speed so that the crank pistons and everything that rotating assembly inside can do its job effectively. Uh, for this one, it's a little over a thousand RPMs, but the motor itself actually rotates at around 3,600 RPMs. Uh, and that's uh, located on a sticker on the side of the motor. The issue we come into is that we need to find the correct ratio for the pulleys from here for the electric motor to this, to the actual cast iron pump. So we'll actually go through that math as like a little bit of review what we did early in the year. Uh, I'll show you how that's done. And then we'll also look at basically the, P, um, uh, the PSI that's generated um, from the actual pump itself and a couple of other calculations too to get us through. Uh, that's really about it. Air compressors, not terribly too difficult. You got to see inside a um, older uh, twin cylinder pump and here it is all up and working. So I hope you enjoyed this. Any questions, let me know. Uh, we're gonna go run through some math now. Okay, so one of the first issues that we encountered is that when replacing the pump on our air compressor, that the electric motor had a pulley on it. The air pump itself also has got a pulley on it. So we're just drawing a real basic pump here. It's cooling fins. So that pulley 
on that pump measured 14.5 inches. That is our air pump. And we need to run at 1050 RPM. That is the, that's just the designated by the manufacturer. Our electric motor, here we go, like this, runs at 3,650 RPM. Motor, and it's connected with the belt from here to around there, belt. So we need to get the proper size pulley. So what pulley do we need on our electric motor? To use that, we use gear ratio. So gear ratio of D out over D in equals angular velocity in over angular velocity out. Our output size is 14.5 inches over X, which equals our input speed of 3,650 RPM over our output of 1,050 RPM for the air pump. So then we can multiply 14.5 inches times 1,050 RPM, and that equals 3,650 RPM times X. Divide both sides by 3650. So we get a final equation of 14.5 inches times 1050 RPM over 3650 RPM equals X in inches. And when we plug that into a calculator, I believe we get about 4.17 inches. So what since they didn't sell a 4.17 inch pulley, I rounded up to a 4.25 inch pulley. Now the advantages of that is that it'll make the actual output speed slightly slower, uh, which saves a little bit on air compressor life. So we need for the electric motor, 4.25 inch pulley. And there you have it. That's how you calculate the uh, pulley size for when you're doing an uh, air compressor swap with uh, the same motor or vice versa. You could replace the electric motor and then get a different size pump pulley right there as well. Uh, sorry, electric motor pulley. All right, so that's the first problem all done. Okay, for our next one, let's suppose we have a piston that's got to apply a label. So there's my piston, a label to some sort of piece of mail. So there's the mail. And it's gonna push down onto that, that's our label. And we know that this piston, let's say it is 0.5 inches in diameter. It needs to apply a force of five pounds to get the label to stick. So what gauge pressure do we need to fix the label. So it's pretty straightforward. So we're gonna use pressure equals force over area. We know that our force is five pounds over a 0.5 inch diameter. So now we go, we have to take that 0.5 inch diameter, convert that to an area. So five pounds over 0.5 inches squared, right, times pi. So equals five pounds over, so 0.5 inches squared. Let's get the calculator out for that one. There's our calculator. So 0.5 squared is 0.25 times pi equals, so that's 0.78, let's move this out of the way. So five pounds, 0.78 inches squared. And from there, 
we just divide the two. So five divided by 0.78. And we get 6.4 PSI. So you would actually end up setting the gauge on the uh, regulator to about 6.4 or 7 PSI, and then that would properly affix that label to that. Relatively straightforward. All right, uh, that's the last problem from here, and uh, the rest I'll give you some uh, to do on your own. Okay, have a good day.